I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. I love the opportunity that seed starting gives me to do some extra gardening anytime, but especially in winter when there's really little else to do to even get my hands dirty. And with so many of us watching our expenses these days, starting plants from seeds offers the best of both worlds. And more companies are specializing in the type of seeds they offer. So you can buy organic seed or avoid genetically modified seed, and you can grow many hard to find heirloom varieties that you just can't find anywhere else. If you're gardening on a budget, you can't do any better than free. And it's pretty easy to get your hands on free seeds by just asking other gardeners. We all tend to buy more seeds than we can use, and rather than let those seeds go to waste, we can share and swap seeds with others. You can discover new and unusual varieties while learning growing tips from someone who's already grown it in their own yard. Plus, it's a great way to preserve those special heirloom varieties. Now when you swap those seeds with your friends or you buy them at the store, you assume that they're going to germinate no problem, right? And in fact, seed packs have a use by date on the package to let you know when to use them by for optimal performance. But the nice thing about seeds, most varieties will last for several years beyond that point with proper care and storage. So just because it's past that date doesn't mean the seeds are no longer viable. But how do you know about those older or questionable seeds? I mean, it would be nice to know if they're going to sprout before you plant them out, right? Well, for that, I use a germination test. So the goal of the germination test is to determine the approximate percentage of seeds that are still good, like Sean's magic bean seeds here. He has no idea how old they are. But you can use that percentage to see whether or not you need to plant more seeds out to reach your goal, or on the other hand, whether or not it's worth even planting out at all. First, take a paper towel and moisten it with a spray bottle. Place 10 of the seeds to be tested onto the paper towel. Next. Fold the wet paper towel over the seeds and carefully place them inside a plastic bag. Seal and label the bag with a date and keep it in a warm environment. After a few days, begin checking the seeds daily for germination. Depending on the variety you're testing, the seeds may begin to sprout in a day or two, or they may take up to several weeks to start. If nothing happens, you know the seed is no longer good. A low number of sprouts means you need to plant more thickly, and a high number of sprouts means you're good to go with a regular planting. Well, not bad. Nine out of 10 seeds sprouted, and you don't even need to be a math whiz to know that that's 90%, which is why you test for 10 seeds to make it easy to calculate the percentage. And for a fast start in the garden, you don't want to throw these out because they're ready for planting. Now for the most part, with proper soil moisture and the appropriate soil mix, most of the seeds that we're likely to plant in our garden will germinate with little care on our part. But that's not true for all seeds. In nature, seeds are exposed to all kinds of elements like wind and rain and freezing temperatures and even the digestive tracts of animals. Now that helps break down the hard outer coating of certain seeds, which makes it easier for them to germinate. At home, we can mimic some of those harsher elements found in nature to break through the hard outer coating of some of those tougher seeds with time-honored tricks gardeners have been using for centuries. The first trick is the warm soak. To soften their hard outer layer, some seeds benefit from a simple soaking in warm water before planting, like okra, peas, beans, and nasturtiums. And it's as simple as placing the seeds in a cup of warm but not boiling water and let them set for 24 hours and then plant out as usual. Another method of breaking through the seed coat of extremely hard surfaces is through a process called scarification, and that's just a fancy name for scarring or scratching. But it allows water to penetrate into the seed, which enables it to germinate. 
Now, Mother Nature does a great job of handling that process outdoors. But at home, the best way to do that is by rubbing each seed on a file or a piece of sandpaper. And how much? Well, just until you can see a change in color in the seed is a good rule of thumb. And here's a great tip. You see this dot? That's where the shoot is going to emerge, so you want to scratch the opposite end so that you don't damage the eye of the seed. And then, just scratch each seed and plant as usual. And then there's stratification. Now the term refers to simulating nature's ebbs and flows of winter and early spring. Now some seeds need that temperature variability as they're cue to sprout. And some perennial seeds and a lot of tree seeds require stratification before they germinate. Indoors, we can mimic that by putting seeds in a plastic bag with a moist but not wet soil mix and placing it in the refrigerator for about 10 to 12 weeks. When you bring the bag out of the cold to plant, the seeds think it's springtime and they'll begin to sprout. Now anytime you can plant seeds directly into the ground, you're going to save yourself a lot of time. But how do you know what seeds perform best when you sow them directly into the ground? Well, that information is on the back of the seed pack, along with information like how far apart to space the seeds and the rows. Now right now, it's midsummer and the classic crops are in full swing. But I want a fall crop of beans, and so I'm going to plant those now. And one of my favorite tools for that when I'm out in the garden is this planting stick. And I put that where I want the row, I get my trowel, and I just draw a line along the edge. I also have it notched out so I know how far apart to do my spacing. So I really love this tool. So I'm going to go ahead and plant a couple rows right now. Okay, the seeds are in place and now I just need to cover them up. And I could do that with the compost that I put down here, no problem, that would be fine. But I've learned a trick that I've had great success with and that is to cover the seeds with a soilless seed starting mix. And there's a couple advantages to that. For those tender seedlings, it really helps because it's so lightweight that the seedlings have no problem pushing through and some heavy soil might encumber that germination. But it also is designed to hold a lot of moisture and that's really important as seeds try to germinate. And then the other thing is, once I put the soil as mixed down, I'm able to see it more clearly so I know exactly where my seeds are. Okay, the soilless mix is down and now it's a matter of just lightly tamping it in and I can use the board for that as well. Okay, I'll add a little water and in probably about five days for these bean seeds, I should see some sprouts. Now indoors, it's a different matter. You should always start off with a clean sterile mix engineered for starting seeds. In fact, mixes of this type will say so right on the bag. In addition to its lightweight and moisture holding capacity, there aren't any soil diseases in here. So you won't be subjecting your young seedlings to pathogens that are common in ordinary garden soil. So these bags only cost a few dollars and they're well worth the investment to get those seeds and seedlings off to a really good start. Starting plants from seed is a really simple process and you're likely already familiar with it, but let's just take a minute to review for guaranteed success. Now, the first thing you need to know is that you can put your seeds into any kind of container as long as you have drainage. And then rule number one, always start with a high quality seed starting mix. Now there's a couple ways that you can do that. You can add the mix to the containers and then add the water, but I find that to be a little messy for the surrounding area. So I like to just get a big container and add all the seed starting mix at once and then the water and keep mixing until it's the consistency of like oatmeal. And then it's time to put it in the containers. Let's do that now. All right, not too messy. Not nearly as messy as Nathan in the kitchen. <laughs> no, he's a very clean chef. Get that away for now. This one. 
that. Now, I could probably be poured in. Okay, that looks pretty good. And now I'm just gonna sow my seed. I always refer to the instructions on the back of the packet to know exactly how deeply to plant it. And that's what I'll do with these tomatoes and I'm planting some lettuce. Now, the tomatoes, they like a little darkness, so I'll plant these about a quarter to a half inch deep and put a little more soil on top. Now, depending on how precious your seeds are or how particular you are, you could get really careful with this and I just kind of wing it and get one or two. Maybe if I get three in one slot, that's okay. Okay, now the lettuce, sprinkle right across the top. And I'll come back and divide later. Once that's germinated, I'll pull these little seedlings apart and plant them out in the garden. Now because these need a little darkness, come back with a little soil across the top Lightly tamp it in, and that will be all I need to do, other than add the label so I know what's what. Okay, the seeds are sown. I've lightly tamped them in. Now it's just time to add the labels so I remember what's what. And I made these labels from mini blinds, so that makes them free. That's always a nice tip, right? There's the lettuce. And then it's just time to cover it up. Now I have the store-bought covers, but you know why not use something free like this plastic wrap? Because the objective is just to hold the moisture in and let some light through. So this works perfectly for that, but since I have the covers, I might as well use them. So what about another different or fun way to start your seeds indoors? Or maybe you're just looking to be more efficient and eliminate a lot of that plastic. Well, you might want to try starting your seeds in soil blocks. It's a system that's so often used with small scale farmers and avid home gardeners. And one of the best parts about soil blocks is that anything that you can do in a pot or a pack, you can do in the soil block. And once you have all of your equipment, you're not going to have to go back and have that extra expense every time you need to start more seeds. A soil block is pretty much what the name implies. A block like this made of lightly compressed soil. And because it holds together so well, it serves as the container too. But because there's no physical barrier around the edges, the roots don't become pot bound. But once the roots come in contact with soil again, they take off. To make your own soil blocks, start with a flat bottom tray to mix the potting media and be sure to use a specially blended mix formulated specifically for making soil blocks since they need to hold their shape. The mix I use includes peat, sand, soil, and compost. Once you have your mix in the tray, it's time to add the water. On average, you'll need about one part water to three parts dry mix. Then blend it all together to the consistency of oatmeal. Next, it's time to make the soil blocks. The key to the system is the tool. It's often referred to as a blocker. They come in various sizes, but basically it's an ejection mold that forms the cubes out of the growing mix. Have enough mix in the container so that it's deeper than the block maker. Scrape off the excess and place the blocker on the seed flat. Then eject the blocks by pressing down on the spring-loaded handle while you raise the form in a smooth, even motion.
After each series, dip the blocker into water to rinse, which also serves to lubricate it for the next series. And if you have the need to make larger soil blocks, since the tool comes in different sizes, you have plenty of flexibility. So once you have your soil blocks made, it's time to plant the seeds, and that can be a bit tedious, but I found a great way to speed up the process. So find something with a sharp point on it, like these wooden skewers work perfectly for that. And then get a ramekin or something that you can put a little water in and put the tip in the water, and then touch it to the seed, and the seed should stick right to the tip. Touch the tip to the soil block, and you're good to go. You don't even need to cover it up. Now you do that for as many soil blocks as you need to seed, and then you place it under the lights and wait for germination. Now these are seeds that I started about a week and a half ago, and they are ready for planting. It's summer, no problem, and no transplant shock either. That's one of the advantages to soil blocks. But what if it were like still midwinter and you needed to buy some time before they go in the ground? Well, that's the reason for all these extra blocks. Let me show you the process because we're going to bump them up. So I'll take one of the smallest ones, just slide underneath it with a knife, and then I'll just drop it into, let's see, let's try this one. And those squares are made to accept the smaller soil block. Okay, so now the roots will continue to grow. You'll have a strong plant, but what if I need to buy some more time? Well, that's the reason for the big boy. So let me step it up one more time. Same process. Slide something flat underneath. Drop it into the square. Those roots will grow out. Your plants will grow strong. No transplant shock and you are ready to go. Now I know this is a lot of information and we have it on our website under the show notes for this episode, the instructions on how to do this and where to get all the supplies. The address is the same as our name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Okay, so the seeds have sprouted and they're well on their way. But if you're in a hurry to speed up the germination process, a simple way to do that is with a heat mat like this one. Now they come in all different shapes and sizes, but the premise is the same. You simply plug it in, the mat warms up, and it raises the soil temperature to about 70 degrees. Now that's an ideal temperature for a lot of different seed types to germinate. But you could take the low-tech approach and do nothing, in which case the seeds will probably still just germinate fine. It just takes a little bit longer. Or you could do like a lot of people I know, they find an existing warm surface of the house and a common place for that is the top of a refrigerator. And you just place the tray on top of that and it works just fine. But the main thing is, just don't put your tray on an area that's too warm. Now once the seedlings sprout, the cover comes off. And to keep your plants healthy after that, you wanna keep air circulating across the soil surface. And a simple solution for that is with an inexpensive fan like this. I keep mine running all the time, and not only does it keep my plants healthy, it makes the stems and overall plants tougher and better able to withstand the harsher conditions when I plant them outside. Now a common problem many people encounter once their seeds sprout are these long leggy stems and that's always an indication that your plants aren't getting enough light. So what do you do? Well you give them as much light as possible and even a south facing window usually isn't enough. But a simple solution is to get these shop lights at your home improvement store. They're only like $10 and you get two 40 watt fluorescent lights and you keep the lights on for about 16 hours a day and you do that with an automatic timer but the key is to keep the light as close to the top of the plants as possible, like an inch or two is ideal. And as the plants grow up, you raise the light and everything will be just fine. You know, of all the years that I've been gardening, I still never tire of seeing my garden come to life. From those early seeds I sow in wintertime all the way through to that final harvest of fall, it never gets old. And I also love to save those seeds throughout the year so I can replant them into my garden next year so the cycle continues. Now there is a lot of information to know and we have more on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, it's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. And you can also watch all of our past episodes there too. Thanks for joining us. I'm Joe Lample and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. Oh man, I love this. <laughs> all right, check this out. Organic heirloom, black creme tomatoes, some of my very favorite varieties right here. I know we got to film, but you know what? I'll see you guys in a couple minutes. I have a little tomato.